me. I ask that you use me and be glorified in this time together. I cannot do this without you. I do not possess the strength. I do not possess the knowledge outside of myself. But Holy Spirit, I thank you, God, that with you, all things are possible. I thank you that you are my teacher. I thank you, Lord God, that you are the one who lead me into all truth. And I pray that on tonight, my, my words will be clear. My heart will be um, understood. And more importantly, Lord, people will come to know you in a greater way, that they will know that you are concerned about the things that concern us, that they will know, God, that you are a God that is acquainted with our anguish. You're acquainted with our pain. And Father God, not only are you aware of it, but you desire to heal us, you desire to restore us, and you desire to make us whole. And so God, I thank you that tonight as we talk about the bleeding heart and an anguished soul, that Lord, you will comfort us through your scriptures. We praise you. We thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's get started. We're on day 30, um, page 119, if you're following along in the book, 40 Days to Freedom. Um, and if you're wondering who I am, I did pin, pin it so you can see I'm Charity Israel, um, also known as Love Lives Free, author of 40 Days to Freedom. So let's get started. Day 30. A bleeding heart and an anguished soul. I will be glad and rejoice in your unfailing love, for you have seen my troubles and you care about the anguish of my soul. You have not handed me over to my enemies, but you have set me in a safe place. Psalm seven, Psalms 31, 7 and 8. I find it interesting that you can break up with a man in hopes of it bringing you peace and you still find yourself stressed out over how to handle life after it. I have almost driven myself mad trying to figure out what is next and whether I have missed an opportunity to finally be a man's wife. As anxiety attempted to ruin my morning, I felt a prompting to turn my Bible to Psalms 31 and 6. I immediately started weeping at this beautiful reminder that God knows the condition of my heart. It is with this assurance that I am going to surrender it all to God. I'm going to trust that there is no good thing that he will uphold from those who walk upright. I'm going to tr focus on fulfilling my purpose and fixing the things I have neglected in my personal life. I have been under this illusion that my wholeness will come from being connected to someone. However, I have discovered that two people will destroy each other trying to love one another with broken hearts. I have some emotional baggage and physical things that need my undivided attention. I am quite certain that if I do not deal with these things this time, I am going to be in the same situation with someone else. I managed to fall in love with severely emotionally damaged men in hopes that my love would restore them. However, without fail, I get hurt because hurt people truly do hurt people. This savior mentality has caused me great pain, and now I'm the one, the emotionally damaged one. If I do not deal with the brokenness in my heart, I too will become a hurt person that hurts people. In my efforts to find love and be loved, I have become a casualty of war. Now I am in the infirmary with a bleeding heart that only the chief heart surgeon can heal. God, please heal this heart of mine. So um, this particular one, if you were on last night, you know that I talked about um, the benediction and how I had to break up with a guy that I thought would be the person that I would spend the rest of my life with. And so this this um, this one was basically a follow up from the emotional pain that I was feeling, you know, even after giving the benediction and knowing that I did what was right for me and what what brought me peace, I still ended up, you know, um, hurt because, you know, once you have given your time, you've given your attention, you've given your affection, you've given all that you could to an individual, even after you separated yourself, you're still in that place of God. I am in pain. God, I am in anguish and Lord, I need you to heal my heart. And so basically I just took some time and I got real with God. And I told him, I said, Lord, this is where I'm at. And I realized now that I have been loving people from a broken space. I've been trying to love people because the thing about what I discovered is if I would give my attention to people who were more emotionally damaged than I was, it gave me an opportunity not to focus on my pain. 
because I was busy trying to fix them. I was busy trying to help them. That savior mentality. It's like, oh, I'm going to love on you. I'm going to bring um, bring you back to health. I'm going to bring you back to life with my love. And as a result, me trying to love them and me giving them all of that energy, I ended up neglecting my own pain. I ended up neglecting the heartbreaks that I was experiencing. And so then I ended up getting in a relationship with somebody um, that we pretty much were in the same place emotionally and we kept clashing we kept bumping heads and I finally had to sit back and say okay this pain is not from him this pain is from past experiences this pain is from things that I have not dealt with this pain is from that, re that relationship back in high school or the relationship that I didn't have with my father and so I had to start taking some responsibility for the place of pain that I was in and I had decided that God when I broke up with that individual that I was going to take some time and I was going to confront my heart that I was no longer going to make people responsible for securing my insecurities, but I was going to take my little insecure heart, take my trust issues, take, take my um, independence that get in the way sometimes, take my frustration and all of my hurt that I've experienced in my life trying to love people and be loved. I'm going to submit it to my God. I'm going to su submit it to the Lord. And I'm going to trust him with my heart. And not only that, like I said, I also went to counseling because what I discovered again is that that relationship and the way that it, the way that it ended, it really was for me to, it gave me an opportunity to do some introspection. And I had to stop blaming everybody around me because I kept attracting the same kind of guy, this extremely emotionally broken person, this person who was in need of, you know, a mother's love, a mother's care and all of that stuff. And so I had to ask myself, why? Why are you attracting those kind of people? And um, I did some homework. I started being honest about who I was. I started being honest about my relationships and my past experiences. And um, God in his awesomeness, he began to heal my heart because I surrendered my heart to him. I surrendered my experiences to him. I surrendered my anguish and my pain. And so tonight what we're going to talk about is... Um, I want us to see through scripture that um, we are not the only ones that experience anguish, that we experience hurt, that we experience pain. But there are people in the Bible that um, can relate. And Mr. Magic 420, I hate that therapy didn't help you. You probably needed another therapist. And I hate that whatever that you experienced with that particular therapist, I hate that that happened for you. But I do hope that you will give therapy a, a chance again. I mean, it's like with anything in life. Sometimes we sit up here and we discount. We say because we had one experience with, say, a preacher or we had one experience with anything, we automatically discredit the whole thing instead of just acknowledging maybe that individual was not the right person for me maybe that pastor was out of order or maybe that you know that christian or that evangelist whoever it was maybe they weren't in maybe they weren't right maybe they weren't the person who was supposed to speak into my life and so let's not discredit stuff because we gave one person one shot or maybe we gave two people a shot and it didn't work out as I said you know as we've been doing this I've been telling us let's be um, aggressive as it pertains to seeking our freedom if that person didn't work out find somebody else and don't stop until you get the help that's necessary for you and so let's go to, um, hold on. I don't know what's going on. These little trolls are coming on in here tonight, but they shall and will be blocked. How about that? Um, so I want us to be reminded, particularly, um, that God is aware of our anguish. He's aware of our pain. He's aware of that deep hurt that we're experiencing that sometimes that we've been holding on to. And for whatever reason, we won't let go of it. Maybe we have allowed it to identify us, um, you know, that particular experience, that particular breakup, that particular um, heartache, that particular uh, person who walked away from our life. We've just been holding on to it. And tonight, what I'm going to encourage us to do is to give it to God. I'm going to encourage us to leave 
receive it in his presence. I'm going to encourage us to no longer carry it, no longer allow it to be a crutch in our life, but throw those crutches of our pain, our anguish, and our bleeding heart at the feet of Jesus. That is not only to cast cast our cares and to cast our burdens on him. So let's go to um, Psalms 34, 1, 34, 17 through 19. Um, it says the righteous cry out and the Lord hears. He delivers them from all of their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted. He saves the contrite, contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him from them all. So I need us, particularly those of us who are in this place of brokenness. We are in this place of anguish. We are in this place of pain. Let Psalms 34, 17 through 19 be your go-to go scripture during this time. Again, that was Psalm 37, 34, 17 through 19. And if somebody could put it in the comments for me, it would be greatly appreciated. That was Psalm 34, 17 through 19. So if you are a person who is dealing with an emotional experience that you've had, maybe it was a bad relationship, maybe it was a failed business, maybe it was a um, opportunity that didn't come through, I'm encouraging you to stand on Psalms 34, 17 through 19. Because the Lord is near to the brokenhearted. He saves the contrite in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them from them all. And so tonight we're going to talk about different places where, yes, that was correct, Paris. We're going to talk about different places where um, we can see the Lord delivering them out of their trouble, where the Lord comes to the rescue of those who are in very dark places and spaces in life throughout the Bible. So number one, we're going to talk about people with painful past who parents only see their past pain, regret um, their past pain and regret when they look at you. I need you to know that Jabez could relate to your anguish. So if you are an individual who, you know, growing up, your mom, all she talked about is you're going to be like your daddy or all she talked about is you this fast little girl or you stupid or you dumb. It might have been anybody in your family. When they look at you, they talk about their past experiences. When they look at you, they see, they see your pain. I want you to understand that Jabez was aware and was familiar with that same kind of anguish. And I want you to see how the Lord came to his rescue first chronicle first chronicles 4 9 through 10 it says now Jabez was more noble than his brothers his mother had named him Jabez saying because I bore him in pain and Jabez called out to the God of Israel if only you would bless me and enlarge my territory may your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from pain and God granted the request of Jabez. I want to encourage those of you who have grown, grew up in an environment and even to this day it hunts you the experiences that you had because people only remembered you by maybe something that your dad did to you. Maybe you're the child of somebody who's a murderer. Maybe you're the child of someone who is um, on crack or you know th that was a drug user. Maybe you're the child of someone who has experienced some great pain and only people remember you by the pain that your parents experience and even your parent maybe all they remember you is by you look just like your daddy or you ain't gonna be nothing you know you're gonna be just like me all of this stuff if you're one of those people I want you to know that the same way the same God that came to the rescue of Jabez will come to the rescue of you when you do as Jabez did Jabez cried out to the Lord and he said to him he said um, if only you would bless me and enlarge my territory may your hand be with me and keep me from harm so that I will be free from that pain it is important if you have been holding on to your childhood hurt you've been holding on to your childhood anguish that you allow the Lord to have that tonight and you do that by what Jabez did that is cry out to the Lord and tell him God take my pain take my anguish take my hurt and be with me don't let me be a byproduct of my past experiences. Don't let me be a person who have to live with the shame and the anguish of my childhood. Don't let me be a person that have to live in this, this place of, of regret and this place of hurt because of what I experienced in my childhood or because of what my mother used to call me or because of what my father used to call me or because of what my grandmother used to call me. Let me be someone that even though pain was my past, I walked 
walk victorious from this day forward because I surrender my anguish of my childhood over to you. So again, if you're somebody who have dealt with the anguish of your childhood, I'm encouraging you to do what Jabez did and that is surrender it to the Lord. Um, another person that, hold on, grieving single mothers, Hagar can relate to your anguish. When you get a chance, read Genesis 16 to understand Hagar's background, but we're going to pick up at Genesis 21. So if you are a single mother, understand that you are not alone, that there are women in the Bible who have experienced that pain as well. And Hagar is one of those women. When you get a chance, again, read her full background in Genesis 20, um, in Genesis 16, but we're going to pick up with the story where she becomes a single mother in, um, Genesis 21. And it says this 21 verse nine, it says, but Sarah saw that the son whom Hagar, the Egyptian had born to Abraham was mocking her son. And she said to Abraham, expel the slave woman and her son for the slave woman's son will never share in the inheritance with my son, Isaac. Now this matter distressed Abraham greatly, but it concerned his son Ishmael because it concerned his son Ishmael. But God said to Abram, do not be distressed about the boy and your maidservant. Listen to everything that Sarah tells you, for through Isaac your offspring will be reckoned. But I will also make a nation of the slave woman's son, because he is your offspring. And so we're going to skip down to um, verse 14. And it says, early in the morning, Abraham got up, took bread and skin of water, but them put them on Hagar's shoulder and sent her away with the boy. She left and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she left the boy under one of the bushes. Then she went off and sat down nearby about a bow shot away from, for she said, I cannot bear to watch my son die. And as she sat nearby, she lifted her voice and wept. Then God heard the voice of the boy and the angel of the Lord came to Hagar from heaven. What is wrong with Hagar? Do not be afraid for God has heard the voice of the boy where he lies. Arise, lift up the boy and take him by the hand for I will make him a great nation. Then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. So she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink and God was with the boy and he grew up and settled in the wilderness and became an archer. And while he was dwelling in the wilderness, his mother got him a wife. So this is for the single mothers. Those of you who have been in a position where you've been crying out to God and you said, Lord, I'm in this space all by myself. I don't have anyone to help me. I don't know where my help is going to come from. I tried to do everything right. Maybe some of you, you were in a marriage and then you got married. You Then you got in a divorce and then the man decided to leave or vice versa. You were a man and you were in a marriage and then you got a divorce and your wife decided to leave and now you are sitting in the space of a single parent and you don't know how or where your help is going to come from but I need you to do what Hagar did and that was cry out to the Lord because it says when she cried out to the Lord not only did he hear her cry but he heard the cry of her son and a well came in the wilderness a well came in the desert place and I'm encouraging you if you are somebody who is a single mother and you've been dealing with the anguish of raising your child alone, I'm encouraging you to surrender that to the Lord as Hagar did. Cry out to God and trust that the God of your salvation is going to come to your rescue and he's going to deliver you. Not only is he going to deliver you, but that child who does not have a father or who does not have a mother still can have a great life. God can still do something great through them because the same way it was with Ishmael, he said, he'll still be a great nation in spite of what his past was in spite of his father not being in his life he'll still be a great nation and I'm declaring that over your children's lives as well that as you cry out to the Lord as you allow God to be your salvation as you allow God to be the one to come to your rescue that your children will not fail your children will not fail your children will not fail they will not succumb to the pressures of society but they will be great because their father in heaven is great and even when others have failed them, God will not fail. And then when others have failed you, God will not fail you. And so if you are a single mother and you have been in this place, and again, a single father as well, you can take it as well. 
If you're in a place and you say, God, I'm by myself. I don't know what else to do. I did everything right. And even if you didn't do everything right, you can still cry out to the Lord for help and he will come to your rescue. He hears our anguish. He is aware of our broken heart and he's waiting on us to cry out to him. He's waiting on us to allow him to be our solution. He's waiting on us to be the one that we run to. He's waiting on us to say, God, I cannot do this in my own strength. I cannot do this in my own power. I cannot do this in my own wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. I need someone greater than myself to fix this situation. And so if you are like Hagar, if you are like Jabez, cry out to the Lord. Tell him where you really are at this point in your life and allow the God of your salvation to come to your rescue. Jesus. Hmm. Also, if you are a person, you grieving family members. Mary and Martha can relate to your anguish. John eleven twenty one through thirty five. <laughs> God of your salvation, God of your salvation, He is concerned about what is breaking your heart. Your Creator is concerned about what is breaking your heart. Your Creator is concerned about what is breaking your heart. He did not create you. He did not intend that you live life with a broken heart and an anguished soul. Particularly if you are a believer. That is not how you have to live. You don't have to live bound by that experience. You do not have to live bound by that heartache. He is coming for it tonight. He says, I want your anguish. Just as bad as you want prosperity, just as bad as you want to live in the overflow, just as bad as you want the, the windows of heaven to open up and pour you out a blessing. God is saying, that's how bad I want your heart. That's how bad I want your pain. That's how bad I want your anguish. That's how bad I want your fear and your frustration and your regret. I am a God that's not concerned about your, your, your prosperous state right now. I need your mental state and your heart and your soul to be right everything else could come will come along but right now you are in a broken state of mind and you're functioning out of a place of brokenness you experience your relationships from a place of brokenness and he's saying i want that i died for it give it to me Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. So if you are a person who you have been living with anguish as it pertains to grief, your mother died, your daddy died, your son died, your sister died, your cousin, somebody close to you died, and you have been walking around holding on to that grief, the anguish of grief. Because I will say this, that as long as we live, particularly those of us who, you know, um, death is one of those things that is a part of life. And so I don't necessarily, I don't subscribe to the idea of, you know, just get over it. I, I don't, I don't subscribe to that because particularly when people have been in your life and they have had some kind of impact, there is a hole that comes there. There is some pain that is experienced. There is an emptiness that comes from that, that particular individual not being here anymore. But God did not intend for that person's absence to cause you to stop living life. To cause you to put on your grave clothes in the same day that they died, you died too. He did not intend for you to live like that. And so it is okay to have those moments where you may, you may mourn. Some days you think about that person and you're overcome with grief and you cry it out and then you go on with the next day and maybe you'll smile about them and stuff like that. But I'm speaking to those people who specifically when that individual or those individuals died, you died too. And I am telling you, give your broken heart to God. 
And even if you're upset with him for not showing up, even if you're upset with him for not healing your mama, even if you're upset with him for um, permitting that that um, car accident or allowing that diagnosis to happen, you can tell God that too. You can express God, you can express to God your anguish. You can express to God, God, why didn't you take this person instead? You can express to God, why did you allow this to happen? He did not intend for you to die when they died. And so for those of us who are experienced anguish as it pertains to grief, I want you to be reminded that Mary and Martha, they know that anguish as well. John 21 through 35, it says, I mean, John 11, 21 through 35, it says, Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. But even now, I know that God will give you whatever you ask him for. Your brother will rise again, Jesus told her. Martha replied, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And everyone who believe, who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she answered. I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God who was to come into the world. And after Martha had said this, she went back to get her sister Mary and asked and aside to tell her the teacher is here and is asking for you. And when Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had entered um, the village, but was still a place where Martha had to meet him. And when the Jews who were in the house consoling Mary saw how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her. Supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn. When Mary came to Jesus and, sat and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Hmm. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? And he asked, come and see, Lord, they answered. In verse 35, Jesus wept. He is acquainted with your grief. He is aware of your anguish. He understands your pain. But you got to believe in his power to resurrect your life even after your loved one has passed away. Even after your best friend, your sister, the person that you thought you would never know life without them. You got to know that Jesus Christ, the resurrected one, can resurrect your new, can resurrect your life. Even after you've experienced the pain of the death of a loved one. And I go on to say that because if you read the story, and I hope that you read the whole story, Genesis 11, Lazarus does, Jesus performed a miracle and Lazarus gets up from the grave and people are in awe and they are wild and they are amazed. But I wanted to read the part about Jesus what because I wanted us to understand that he is aware of our anguish, that he is near to those who hurt. He is near to those who have pain. He is near to those who grieve. And so tonight, if you are someone who have been holding on to the anguish of grief, who have stopped living because someone in your life or a few someones in your life have passed away, I'm encouraging you to surrender your broken heart to God Almighty. Tell him the truth about where you hurt. Tell him if you hate him. Tell him if you mad at him. Tell him if you don't know if you can ever trust and love him. Be Just have a real conversation with him. Because I'm telling you, until you connect with your creator, you're not going to experience new life in that area of your life. And there is definitely um, grief counseling. I encourage people to take grief counseling as well. Y'all know I'm going to always be up here um, advocating for therapy. So let, let's just know that about me. Grief counseling as well can assist you. But tonight, take the make the first step by simply having a conversation with God. 
Some of you haven't talked to him since that person passed away. And it's not that you don't love him. It's not that you don't believe in him, but it's just the anguish and the pain that you have experienced has been so deep that it has caused you to believe that a God that has allowed you to experience that kind of pain could not possibly love you. And that is so far from the truth. Sadly, death is a part of the fall. It was something that we ended up, it was a consequence and a result of when Adam and Eve decided to do what displeased God. And I know that may not be comforting, particularly when you just want your mama back and you just want your daddy back. And I give anything to talk to my sister Keisha again or whatever you've been saying to yourself. I know that may not be comforting, but that is the reality. When the fall happened, death happened. The agony, the anguish, the hurt of death happened. And so was it God's original intent that his creation experienced that kind of pain? I don't believe so. But as a result of what has occurred, that is what we experience from time to time. And if you have experienced the aching, relentless, heart-wrenching pain of grief, I am encouraging you to talk to your creator. Tell him how it hurt, when it hurt, why it hurts. Tell him you mad at him about it. Have a real conversation with him. Because he wants your anguish. He wants your pain. He wants your heartache. Because he wants to heal your heart. But as long as you're holding on, he can't heal what you won't let go of. He cannot heal what you won't let go of. And so I'm encouraging you to let go. And I mean, some of us been holding on to it since we were kids. You didn't have an opportunity to have your mother because your mother passed away before you had an opportunity to know who she was. Or your dad passed away before you had an opportunity to know who they were. And you've been holding it against God. But I'm encouraging you to give him your pain so he can heal your heart. Have that conversation with him. Express your frustration with the fact you don't you didn't get an opportunity to know your mom or know your dad and all that stuff. He can handle it. And he wants to handle it. Again, my name is Charity Israel. The Christie Show has allowed me to use her platform to share about my book, 40 Days to Freedom. And tonight we're talking about the anguish of our souls. And I'm encouraging us to let our pain go. Another place where some of us have been carrying anguish. <laughs> Women... With barren wounds, Rachel can relate to your anguish. To the woman who has been crying out to God, all you want is a baby. You look around and you see people mistreating children. You read stories about people harming children. And for the likes of you, you cannot understand. God, why can I? not have a child why am i barren why am why do i why am i not able to reproduce you are not the only one that is that is in that state and there are a couple of bible characters that can relate and my prayer is that you will be encouraged in this moment um rachel genesis 29 verse 31 it says, when the Lord saw that Leah was unloved, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. 
Genesis 30, 22 through 24. Then God remembered Rachel. He listened to her and opened her womb and she conceived and gave birth to a son. God has taken away my shame, she said. She named him Joseph and said, may the Lord add to me another son. That what I just read was Genesis 29, 31 and Genesis 30, 22 through 24. And so women with wounds who can't seem to produce. I want you to know that it doesn't necessarily mean the story is over because you cannot produce in this moment. Because you cannot have the desire of your heart at this moment. I do not know why the wait has occurred. I do not know why it seems to be a delay. I do not know why your womb may be closed to reproduction right now. But what I do know is this. If it is the will of God for you to produce in his divine time and he will cause your womb to open up and you will have that child. And so my prayer is that you would be, and particularly when you get a chance, I want you to read um, the story of Hannah because she she more so um, shows the anguish of a woman who is experiencing barrenness. And that's um, 1 Samuel chapter 1 through 2. So it's chapter 1 and chapter 2. That's 1 Samuel chapter 1 and chapter 2. If you are a woman who is experiencing um, the inability to reproduce, I would encourage you to stand on scriptures like 2 1 Samuel chapter 1 through 2 and then Genesis 29, 31 and Genesis 30, 22 through 24 and cry out to the Lord as, Han as uh, Hannah did. And continue to cry out before him. There's nothing wrong with going to the Lord and telling him the position of your heart. There's nothing wrong with going to him and telling him, man, and your frustrations with this whole process, your frustrations with his sovereignty, your frustrations with, with what appears to, you know, when people say he seems to know best, you can tell God that you're frustrated with the fact that he seems to know best. I mean, you can have a real conversation with the Lord, telling him your anguish, telling him your frustration, telling him where it hurts in your heart. He needs you to do that and you need to do it because you've been carrying these weights for so long. You've been carrying these weights for so long. You've been carrying this anguish for so long that it has become part of your identity. That you don't have joy. You haven't had it in a while. Because the enemy has you so fixed on not being able to produce. The enemy has you so fixed on, um, he, he has even um, become an accuser of the brethren and has, and has suggested that you're not woman enough because you can't produce. That, that you something is wrong with you as a woman because you're not able to have a child. And I'm coming for that liar tonight. That is not true. For whatever reason, the Lord has permitted this particular moment in your life. And I'm suggesting to you and encouraging you to trust his sovereignty in spite of your desire. Submit that desire to the Lord. Submit your anguish to the Lord. Submit your frustration to the Lord. And also, if you're not married and you are a believer trying to have a child outside of marriage, I'm encouraging you to align yourself with scripture. And see the grace of God in your life, even concerning this particular matter. Because some of us be doing some sideways things as believers and we want God to do certain stuff in our life. And we're not, we're living completely outside of the word of God. But as I said, whatever that pain is, and even if you're someone who has experienced, um, Tell God about your abortions. Tell God about your miscarriages. Tell God about your process of reproduction. You can talk to him about that stuff. You can tell him your frustration. You can tell him your anguish. 
You've been holding on to this stuff. This stuff has literally, it possesses your mind. It controls your mind. You're thinking of it day in and day out. You're, you're considering yourself less than a woman because you're not able to produce at this moment. The enemy of your soul has convinced you that maybe you'll never have a child. But right now does not mean forever. Right now is not a permanent situation. It's just this moment. And I will encourage you to trust your God. Even in this space right now, because you don't know what he has on the other end of this life for you. You don't know what he is a, a causing to be manifested in your life. If you would just trust him. Trust his plan. Trust his love. Trust his faithfulness. Trust the fact that he is a father and he gives good gifts to his children. And you can trust him with your heart. Jesus. Parents with troubled children. The Canaanite woman can relate to your anguish. Matthew 15, 15 21 through 28. I'm going to say it again. Matthew 15, 21 through 28. It said, leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. I mean, Sidon. And a Canaanite woman from the region came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is miserably possessed by a demon. But Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came and urged him, send her away for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. But Jesus replied, it is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. <laughs> oh, woman, Jesus answered, your faith is great. Let it be done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. If you are a parent and you are dealing with a troubled child, they may need deliverance. They also may need some discipline and a belt. But you can give your anguish to the Lord. The woman cried out. She said, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is miserably possessed by a demon. And I find it very interesting that the disciples, he came and urged them and they said, send her away for she keep crying out after us. She didn't say Jesus and the disciples. She cried out and said, son of David. I don't know how the disciples figured that she was talking to them when they were crying out to Jesus, when she was crying out to Jesus. And I just found that very interesting that sometimes we, when we're around the person who can help, we automatically associate ourselves when the person tries, to, when, when somebody is asking that individual for help, we take it upon ourselves like they're talking to us when they're not. They want he she wasn't talking to the disciples. She was talking to Jesus. And some of us may need to keep our mouth closed when they're not asking us for help. Don't be like the disciples talking about she messing with us. No, she's not even talking to you. They not even talking to you. Mind your business in 2019. Don't be like the disciples. Going back to your anguish, if you are a parent, and I'm encouraging you to cry out to the Lord. Cry out to the Lord. He understands your anguish. He understands the place that you are in. And if he was faithful and just to deliver the Canaanite daughter, he can deliver your child too. And he will deliver your child. And so if you are in a position where you are frustrated with parenting, you're frustrated because you have done all you can with this child, you have put them in certain programs. You have put them in therapy. You have put them, you have done everything that you could with this child. I'm encouraging you to cry out to him one more time. Cry out to the Lord one more time, the God of your salvation. And trust and believe that he's going to have mercy on you and your baby and your children. And I also want to encourage you too. if you're living something opposite of what you're asking him to do, 
It's going to be extremely difficult for them to follow suit and doing something good and doing something righteous and doing something right when their example is doing something wrong. So if you're crying out and you're asking God to move on your child's behalf, but you have not presented something before them that they could, um, you have not been a good example. I'm encouraging you to be the example that you want them to be. Be the person that you want them to be. And see if they start acting according to what you're showing them versus according to what you're asking them to do, but not showing them. So it's two places I'm challenging you. One, I'm encouraging you to cry out, give your anguish to the Lord. I'm encouraging you to also, if your child needs therapy, don't be ashamed of it, particularly if you know you've done everything you can. Also, if your child is hurting themselves, cutting or even harming people in the household, it does not make you less of a parent to get your child out of their house and into a facility that will bring your home peace as well as bring them peace. And I'm asking you, and I pray that you will seek counsel as well as um, have the wisdom of the Holy Spirit as it pertains to how to deal with that particular child. But cry out to the Lord, give him your anguish, Practice what you're preaching. Practice what you're preaching. Practice what you're preaching. Practice what you're preaching. You can't expect your daughter to stop being fast if every man who says, I like you, you're hollering at, and they can stay in your house the next week. You can't expect your son to, to do certain things and you're showing him the opposite. You don't want him to be a deadbeat. You don't want him to be um, a drug dealer. You don't want him to be um, a pimp or whatever. But these are the kind of men you entertain. But you don't want your child to be that way. So I'm encouraging you. Be the example that you desire your child, your children to be. Show them by example. And maybe a change will come about in your house. But more than anything, cry out to the Lord and tell him your frustration. As it pertains to being a parent, God can handle it. And don't be ashamed of it if you feel overwhelmed by the experience. Don't be ashamed of it if you, you need to get some help. And if that's another thing, too, if you were an individual who grew up in a dysfunctional home and you know that the, the parenting skills that you have are a bit dysfunctional because they just like your mamas or they're just like your daddy or they're just like the grandparent that you was raised by. In order to keep that same dysfunction that you're growing, that you're living with as an adult, it is OK to go seek out some parenting skills. It is okay to find out a different way to be a parent. And so I will encourage you, if you know that you, because I mean, you know, even in your heart, because sometimes you may even be saying, God, I don't mean to be that mean to my child. Why am I so mean to my child? Why am I cursing them out? Why am I speaking um, ill things over them? Because that's how your parents talk to you. That's how your mama talked to you. That's how your daddy talked to you. That's how your mama talked to you. That's how your daddy talked to you. And that is how you're living. That's how you're treating your children. And it's nothing wrong with saying, look, I'm messing up here. I'm creating the same kind of animal that I am. I'm creating the same kind of person that I am. Go get help. Ask for help. Go seek help. It doesn't make you less of a parent. It doesn't make you less of a person. To go find the tools that you need to be a better parent and to be a better person.
So if your anguish is that of a, a troubled child, Matthew 15, 21 through 28. Hmm. We're almost finished here. Those of us with a thorn in your flesh, Paul can relate to your anguish. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 9 says, if I, Even if I wanted to boast, I would not be a fool because I would be speaking the truth, but I remain, but I refrain. So no one will credit me with more than he sees in me or hears from me or with these surpassingly great re um, revelations. So to keep me from being becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I plead with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest on me. If you are a person with a thorn in your flesh. And for many of us, it is that thing that we have cried out to the Lord. And for whatever reason, that joker stays close. It will not go away. And we still keep crying out and we still keep pleading with the Lord and we still keep asking him, God, take it away. God, remove it. God, get it out of my life. God, get it away from me. Paul can relate to that anguish. He can relate to what it's like to be in a position of power and to be in a position where people are looking at you and that they can hear what you're saying, that they, they take your words to heart and that they... um they they look up to you, but you got this one thing that if everybody found out about it, it'll probably change their mind about you. It'll probably make them not too interested in hearing what you have to say. They're thorn in your flesh. Paul can relate to it. And just like Paul, we have to keep crying out to the Lord. And we have to trust that like he told Paul, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. This thing is not here to bring you shame, but it's here to keep you humble before me. It's here to keep you continuously in relationship and communication with me. It's here so that you know it's not you keeping me, but me keeping you. So if you are an individual that you keep crying out to the Lord about this particular thing, if this one thing could get out your life, you'll be a perfect Christian. If you could just stop this one thing or stop saying this one thing, you will be perfect. And God is simply saying, my grace is sufficient in that area. I'm leaving you weak there so you can trust me. I'm leaving you weak there so you can keep communication with me. I'm leaving you weak there so that you will know that it's not you that's doing this, but it's me. That I'm your grace. That I'm your power force. And I'm the one who is leading and guiding you. I'm your strength. So if you're somebody... Who is dealing with a thorn in your flesh. And you have cried out to the Lord. And you keep crying out to him. I'm encouraging you. To keep surrendering that thing to the Lord. Keep telling him about the anguish in your soul. And know that in your weakness. His strength is made perfect. Um, me, Ju, me, me, Joss, fruit tea. I don't know. I probably messed that up, but, um, you said, what if that thorn, but your spouse thorn, depending on what the thorn is, because if it's something like R. Kelly's thorn, you need to put your, your spouse in jail. How about that? If it's, if it's something illegal that the, um, police can handle, I don't know. 
So it really depends on what your spouse thorn is. Um, if you want to DM me to further talk about it, we can do that. But um, I can't really make a I can't really make a call on that because I don't know the depths of it. But like I said, if it's something like perversion or something like that, that may not be your cross to bear. So you need to hear the Lord. And if the police is required, you need to call the police. And love him from the jail cell in Jesus name. I don't know what it is. So like I said, DM me. Um, and I could better express or better, um, better help, honestly. So, um. Uh, Let's see. What else? Oh, we have one more thing and we're done. It's um, those who have to yield. Man, man, man. Those of us who have to yield our will to God's plan. Jesus can relate to your anguish. Luke 22, 39 through 43. And it says, Jesus went as usual to the Mount of Olives and the disciples followed him. When he came to the place, he told them, pray that you will not enter into temptation. And he withdrew about a stone's throw away beyond them. Where he knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but your will be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And in his anguish, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like drops of blood falling to the ground. I'm encouraging you. If you are an individual who is at war with the will of God concerning your life, know that Jesus is familiar with your anguish. He knows the frustration. He knows the pain. He knows the hurt that's associated with giving up your will in exchange for God's. But I'm encouraging you the same way that he surrendered, you will have to surrender. You will have to surrender. You will have to surrender because the word tells us in Mark 8, 34 through 35, it said, Jesus called out to the crowd along with his disciples and he told them, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and for the gospel's sake will save it. So we all are in this position where we are having this anguish in our soul where will I do the will of the Father or will I do the will of my flesh? Will I do the will of God or will I surrender to my past pain and my my past um and what society says I should be doing and what society says I should be? We are all in that state. We are all in that place where we're honestly wrestling daily. Who will I let win today? Who will I let show up today? Jesus is well acquainted with that kind of anguish. He knows the pain of wanting to do one thing, but knowing that there's a greater thing that you must do. Because had he not went to the cross, where would we be? And so I wonder what would happen if you decided to take up your cross. I wonder how many lives will change. I wonder how many people will come to know God. I wonder how many people will be encouraged and uplifted and restored in their faith if you decided to take up your cross and walk. To take up your cross and follow him. Jesus had an option in that garden just like we do, like we do every day. And it is my hope and my prayer that you will make a decision just like Jesus did. <laughs> to say, Father, if you are willing to take this cup from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. 
That is the position of real believers. That is the position of mature saints. That is the position of those who have said, God, I gave you my life for real. That is the position of those who seek to please the father above themselves. That is the position of those who say, God, what you desire for my life, what you planned and what you intended is far more important than my plans and my intentions. And so if you are somebody who has been dealing with some real anguish, you are somebody who has been dealing with the pain of deciding to, to choose to choose whether to give your will over to God or keep doing things your way. If you are somebody who is dealing with the anguish of a troubled child, if you're somebody dealing with the anguish of, of grief and a loved one that is that you have lost a loved one, if you're somebody who is dealing with being a barren woman, you have your womb has been closed up and shut off for a reason, for a certain reason. If you're somebody who um with a thorn in your flesh, somebody that's like the Canaanite woman, is somebody that is um what was the first one? Can't even find it. Single mother. And somebody who is living with the regret of your past. And anything in between all of those things, I'm encouraging you to give your bleeding heart. Give your broken heart, give your anguished soul over to your creator. Tell him the truth about where you stand. Tell him the truth about how you feel. Tell him the truth about how you may possibly feel neglected by him. How you may feel that he messed up and he messed up. And that he got you messed up with the way that he has caused your, with the way your life has happened, what has happened in your life. You can tell God all of that. In the same way that I had to get in this book and I had to confess all my junk. And honestly, all my junk not in here. I'm debating if I need to do a part two, part three, part four, five, six, ten. Shoot, because it's a lot of stuff that I had to give to the Lord. And when it comes to my mind, I'm constantly giving it to him. But I'm telling you, I found some real freedom. And I found a real relationship with God when I started being honest with him about who I was. When I stopped hiding behind religion, when I stopped hiding behind my my spiritual gifts, when I stopped hiding behind the image that people um, had for me, when I stopped hiding behind the facade that I was putting on, when I got tired of me being tired, I started telling God the truth. When I got tired of busting at the seams and just being in a place of just emotional distress and really miserable and not happy inside. And I'm up here encouraging people. I'm encouraging people. I'm telling them daily. You can walk in freedom. I'm telling them daily. You can your identity in Christ. I'm telling you all this stuff, but I'm not even living it out for myself. When I finally decided that if this salvation is real, I wanted everything that it entailed for my life. I had to start being honest. And tell God, this is who I am. This is what I like. This is what I do when I'm mad. This is what I do when I'm, I'm glad. This is what I do when I'm frustrated. This is, I had to tell him everything. And yeah, he knows, but I had to confess because it was holding my soul hostage. It was holding me bondage. It was keeping me a prisoner. And so if you're that person, just tell God the truth about who you are and make freedom your pursuit this year like never before. Get your Bible, get your book, get books like this, get you a therapist, get you a life coach, get you a financial planner, get you a, a, some new friends, whatever it takes. For you to get in that place of freedom in your life. I'm encouraging you to do it. And then if you said, you know what? I've been in this place for too long. I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do. Reach out to someone that's not necessarily living the life that you want to live, but someone that you have said, okay, well, this person seems to be a little positive. This person seems to be going in a direction that I would kind of like my life to go. Reach out to that individual. 
See if they will be open to sharing you some sharing with you some of the steps they took to become a better person, some of the steps they took to become a free individual. Or what appears to be a free individual. I don't know what their life is, but reach out. Because freedom is available. To whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And it's time that we as the body of Christ begin to live out that freedom. So I'm going to read the prayer. Also, um, this is this particular day I was talking about relationships. So um, the freedom assignment was for the next three to six months. Get back to you. Go back to the list of goals and dreams you have for yourself and start working towards them. Do not date anyone except yourself. In other words, go out and enjoy your own company. So this was something that I had to do after my breakup that I decided, look, I'm not about to mess up no nobody else's son's life. I'm not messing up no other man's life with my emotional baggage and my drama that I would not address. And I took some time and I sat down and I wrote out a list of things that I wanted to accomplish, a list of things that I knew that needed to be addressed in my personal life. And I started doing those things. And so I'm encouraging you, if you're a person who um, you're on this, you're in, at a place of restarting your life. I'm encouraging you to create that list of those goals and those things that you know that you've been putting off and devote some time to yourself to find healing, to get some restoration in your life, to get into a healthier place. It is okay to take time for you. It is okay to acknowledge that you're hurting, to acknowledge that you're in pain, and to acknowledge that I cannot be any good to anyone at this moment in my life until I work on me. And I'm encouraging you to work on you. And so the freedom prayer is, God, I surrender my damaged heart. I acknowledge that I have gone on countless pursuits of finding love, affirmation, and acceptance. I repent for trying to find love outside of you. You should have been my pursuit this entire time. I have given so much of me to other people, and it is time that I put more of an effort in strengthening my relationship with you. I am tired of seeking love from broken people who are incapable of filling the voids inside of me. Thank you for every experience that has brought me to this place. Thank you for the grace to keep this vow. And my only desire from this pursuit is to know you and be healed by your unfailing love. In Jesus name. Amen. So I'm encouraging you. Give your broken heart to the Lord. Give your anguished soul to the Lord. Because all he's going to do is heal it. And please do not go from this live and be like, oh, that was a good live. Oh, that was a good message. Apply what I'm saying. How many more messages you got to hear about God being your salvation, God being a deliverer, God wanting your broken, wanting to mend your broken heart, God wanting to restore you? How many more messages do you have to hear until you take that as the truth and start allowing him to restore you? Start allowing him to renew your mind. I mean, to, to heal you. Start and allow, allowing yourself to partake in the process of being made into a new creation. When are you going to? Put forth an effort. The Bible talks about that it's, it's more to this thing than just being a hearer, but being a doer of the word. And I have shown you in scripture that where people with anguished souls and in jacked up and messed up situ situations, that when they cried out to the Lord, he heard them. And so to me, it only makes sense that if I can see this principle in the Bible, that when an individual cries out to the Lord, he hears them. I should cry out to the Lord so he can hear me. 
I should cry out to the Lord so that he can take this heart, this hurt in my soul. You don't have to carry this into another day of 2019 with you. You have an opportunity to find freedom. You have an opportunity to live free. And I pray that you will. And so, Father, we thank you for the ability to move forward in Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, that we can come to you about who we really are and you will not turn us away. You will not reject us. You will not cast us aside. But Father God, you delight in us being honest about who we are in your presence. And so Father God, I pray that we will be bold enough, courageous enough to come to you as we are with everything about our hearts, everything about our past, everything about our present, and even the desires of our future, that Father, we will lay those things at your feet. And that we will allow you to do the work that it is you desire to do in us. God, we repent of our pride, of holding on to our hurt, of holding on to our pain, of trying to fix us, of allowing ourselves to chase after drugs, alcohol, men, women, status and platforms to cover up our pain, to cover up our anguish, to cover up our frustration. God, I pray that on tonight we will know that we can run to you. That we can yield all of who we are to you. That we don't have to be ashamed of anything about our lives in your presence. And that God, as we surrender who we are to you, you will make our identity as a new creation, a reality in our lives. That Father God, we will know that when we confess it, we are forgiven according to 1 John 1 and 9. We will also know according to 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that we are a new creation. The old has passed away and all things have become new. May we walk in that newness when we surrender our past, our pain, and all the crutches of life that we have been carrying. May we come to know you in a better way, a greater way. And may what you do in our heart be so real That we are compelled to tell others about your healing grace, your love, your forgiveness, your compassion, your long suffering, your mercy, your goodness, and the plans that you have for their lives as well. We love you, we praise you, and we bless you for this time in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Walk in freedom, y'all. We're heading over to do the questions, the 40 Days to Freedom page. Also, if you have sent a request, um, you have to show a proof of purchase of the book to be part of that particular part of the group because we talk about certain things and those individuals have invested in their freedom and I want to respect and honor their decision to do that. So if you want to be part of the live discussion after this, you will have to purchase the book or you can keep watching this. It does not matter. Uh, my, my desire more than anything is that you come into your freedom. You come into who you are in Christ and that you walk boldly in it, unapologetically in it. And um, that you really know that you're redeemed for real, for real. So um, you, um, if you go to the 40 Days to Freedom, which I put it in, I pinned it. If you click that, that and you have um, purchased the book, all you have to do is send me a message with a screenshot of your, either you, uh, you have the book or the receipt. And then I'll add you.